So you've seen LED masks, everyone wears them, there's this light shining on the face, but how does it actually work? How does a light actually cause changes in your skin? And why is it that I can't just sit in front of the ceiling light in my lounge and have the same thing happen? This is gonna be a sort of summary video. It's not gonna be too technical or too in-depth, but a short video to quickly let you understand in terms of the principle, how these things work. I have worked with LED for many, many years. I have taught it all around the world. I had even invented protocols which are used to treat certain conditions with these devices as well. Now, there are three main wavelengths with the most amount of sort of clinical data available and in the most clinical usage all around the world. In the future, there may be other wavelengths and other colors, if you like, technical term is, is wavelength, um, but for now, right now, we're seeing red, we're seeing near-infrared, which is invisible to the human eye, and we're seeing blue. Other people may talk about other things, like green and yellow, that's fine. I think it will be a while before the clinical data for those matches what we have for red, near-infrared, and blue right now. So I'm going to talk about these for this particular video. Let's start with red, that's the one that most people think of. Now, people call it red light therapy, that's fine, it is red light therapy. Technically speaking, you should call it phototherapy or LED therapy and red is one of the options within the umbrella term of phototherapy or LED therapy. For the purposes of this video, I'm gonna call it phototherapy just to be technical. Red light is one of the wavelengths that's used. The reason why I think you shouldn't consider it red light therapy is because by calling it red light, you, you kind of assume that's all there is and you forget the phenomenal benefits that the other wavelengths have as well, uh, which I'm gonna talk about. So red light, uh, first of all, what are we classing as red? because different devices, if you line them up and you turn them all on red, they look slightly different and they will. The reason is because we have uh, light in, in the spectrum of all the different colors. And the reason we see those different colors because the radiation as a particle or a wave, which is called a photon, they're all made of photons, right? But they're all different wavelengths. So if a photon carries this particular wavelength, it's that color, that wavelength, it's that color. If it's really, really short, it might go beyond visible light into UV or X-ray. If it's really, really long compared to visible light, it might go into things like microwaves, etc. So a certain set of wavelengths exist in the electromagnetic spectrum. Depending on the wavelength used, your eyes, when the photon hits your eyes, you will see this color or that color. So when the wavelength of around 633 nanometers hits our eye, then we're gonna register that as a particular type of red. Now the red in phototherapy, typically speaking, is gonna be around 633 nanometers. Why? Well, we have uh, lots of different studies from a very, very long time. In fact, phototherapy um, or low-level light therapy, if you want to be even more technical, um, was really first described by Niels Reiborg Finton, I think, Dutch fairy physicist, late 19th century. And ever since then, we have tried lots of different wavelengths. And it turns out that at the moment, at the time of recording at least, we feel most strongly about 633 nanometers because of the level of evidence and data. So if you're buying a device, look at the wavelength number. Don't look at the color, because that's actually pretty meaningless. There's a whole range of wavelengths that can be within a color, 633. What happens with 633? Well, essentially, that radiation is gonna go into our cells, which we wouldn't be able to do otherwise, because nothing is, is small enough to squeeze through the membrane, apart from single particle or wave of radiation. That then hits a particular area of our cell called cytochrome C oxidase. If you want to look it up, feel free. I'm not gonna to be too technical because this is gonna be a relatively short video giving you uh, as much information as possible as a summary. When red light hits cytochrome C oxidase, essentially what's happening is there is, shall we say, an increase in the activity of that cell with regards to making what we call ATP, adenosine triphosphate. This is an energy currency. So if you wanna to go to some shops and you wanna buy something, you spend cash, pounds, dollars, euros, rand whatever you want in our cells what's happening is lots of different parts of our cells exist there's a, there's a thing over here which produces lysozymes there's a thing over here which produces collagen there's an area over here currently making elastin sort of like tiny little factories all in our cell and we are walking around and we said right can i have some collagen please can i have some elastin please can i have some cadherins can i have some perlican can i have some nitrogen certainly sir that will be 5 atp please or 2 atp I'm exaggerating, but I want to make it simple to understand. So we spend that ATP, that's our cash, our energy cash, and then something comes out and it's produced by the cell. So by using red light, essentially what we're doing is we're hitting cytochrome T oxidase to increase, roughly speaking, the amount of ATP that is being churned out. So we've got more cash to spend so the entire cell's output and function can increase because the economics of that cell 
bear with me if I use that word, uh, but the ATP economics of that cell is looking a lot better. So that's the reason red light seems to help so many things at the same time. It's not about producing collagen or producing elastin or produ improving the tone of the skin. Cells don't work that way. They don't spend Monday trying to make collagen and then Tuesday trying to work on pigmentation. Every, all the factories are working at the same time. So a good functioning cell makes everything, not one particular thing. And so when we hit the ATP production, we improve everything at the same time. So in marketing, when you see red light therapy device and they say it helps this, 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 and this, that's not exaggeration. It truly does help so many things at the same time because it's like if you take a city and you shut off, let's say the uh, electricity supply, everything goes off. If you improve the electricity supply, everything improves. Think of it that way. And that's why red light has you know, so many good effects that we see. But there is such a thing as too much um, and that can cause uh, the wrong thing to happen. And it can make your skin worse at times too. There is a video on my channel um, where a patient actually experienced this and, and I interviewed the patient and you can see for yourself firsthand. That's a, a thing for another day, but that's essentially how we want red light to work. Next is near infrared light, NIR, sometimes it's abbreviated to. Now we can't see this. So some devices, you know, I've had many people message me and say, look, I'm, I'm using this, even professionals actually, I've, I've put it on near infrared, but it's not working. And I said, well, we, you can't see near infrared. It's beyond that part of the spectrum that we, our eyes can register. This wavelength to this wavelength, if, the, if it hits our retina, there's a signal to the brain and we perceive it as a particular color. If it's beyond it in, in that particular area, we can't perceive it. Near infrared is in that region where it's just on the other side of red. And so we can't actually perceive that, but we can feel its effects, right? So what's happening there is, it is also hitting a similar part of the cell it is hitting that energy producing chain within the mitochondria. But how is this different to red light? And why do I personally feel that this is just as fantastic as red, if not more so when it comes to aging? When I say aging, I don't mean looking worse, I mean cellular aging processes. Well, the near infrared, essentially what that's going to do is act as an anti-inflammatory. Think of it as you're shooting paracetamol almost into particular areas. So what's happening is you can get a displacement of nitrogen monoxide. Near infrared can push that nitrogen monoxide out of the way. And nitrogen monoxide, think of it as, let's say, um, you're driving along on uh, traffic going along the road and some protester, for some reason, decides to just stand right in the middle of the road and all the traffic jams up. Now, the traffic going along the road is regular cell function to produce ATP. The red light is going to try and keep improving that traffic so ATP is continually being made. If there's a blockage for some reason, so let's say during inflammation, where there's nitrogen monoxide there stopping the traffic, we can't produce the ATP. And so when we have near infrared, near infrared is radiation which is going to come in, roughly speaking, 830 nanometers based on the synthesis of all clinically available evidence in scientific literature. That 830 nanometer uh, wavelength is going to come in and it's kind of like someone coming onto the road and just shoving that protester out the way so the traffic can get going again. That's the point of it. So it's kind of reversing the inflammation, if you like, by getting rid of the blockage, which is causing that inflammation. And so the cell can resume its activity. And inflammation is one of the biggest drivers of aging, which I'm sure everyone will agree with, who knows anything about biology. And so that's why I personally feel actually near infrared is more anti-aging than red. Um, and the combination, even better, assuming it's clinically appropriate, which in some instances it isn't. Don't assume you can always use red, okay? Near infrared potentially you could always use. Basically in every patient I put it on because how can you cause harm from having too, not, not enough inflammation, right? It doesn't make sense. So always having the anti-inflammatory effect is fine. That's the basis of which near infrared works, roughly speaking, and without being too technical in too much detail. Let's go to the third one, which is blue light. So if you're looking for blue, typically you want roughly speaking around 415 nanometers. And again, that's based on a synthesis of all available evidence. Uh, how many thousands of papers I've read on, on this topic, I don't know exactly how many. Um, but 415 seems to be the absolute king of, of those wavelengths. You will find slight variation. Some people will go for something like 405. Some people go for 420. Some people may even go for 450. I think 450 is too far. Um, but looking around the 415 range, that looks absolutely perfect, I would say. And I think many people would agree with that as well, based on clinical experience. So how is that working? Well, the blue light is going to be targeting uh, something that we call a, a porphyrin. And there are lots of different types of porphyrins. 
And if you, I'm not going to talk about what porphyrins are because I think it will make the video too long, but you can Google that and look uh, to, to find that it's basically a typical type of structure. It's got a sort of flower type arrangement where something is held in place. Pretty beautiful looking molecule, actually. God, that's a really nerdy thing to say. <laughs> that comes in and it can hit things like protoporphyrin 9, which is contained within bacteria. And what happens is when the blue light strikes, we create these things called ROS, ROS, reactive oxygen species. Reactive oxygen species is a charged molecule, right? Typically, you know, things in the cell, roughly speaking, and I'm not going to go into too much depth again, most of the things in the cell are not charged. If they have a charge, they're highly contained. Let's say within the intermembranal space in the mitochondria, where you have lots of charged particles and they're controlled. So when you have an uncontrolled charged particle loose in the cell, it's a bit like a bull in a shop selling antique vases or something and it going in fact <laughs> i don't watch films but there was a time when someone sent me a clip of the borat film uh, i can't remember which borat film it was but he went into a shop that sold loads of antiques and part of the prank was that he would basically touch something it would fall over and then he would fall over loads of times and everything just started dropping off the shelves and it was actually quite funny think of a charged particle think of rats box and species as borat in that shop what this is doing is it's just ping-ponging around because the fact that it's got a charge means it's attracted to something over here and then there and then there and then there and then there. Or it's attracted over here. It then steals a charge from there to neutralize itself. Now that thing's charged. And then you get this chain reaction of like 600 charge swapping situations in a split second. That incredible process is, in, is exceptionally quick and damaging. If that charge particle manages to reach the entire capsule of the bacterium, the wall, what you get is catastrophic structural damage of that bacterium. As a result, it cannot survive. So in this film studio that I rent, um, let's pretend, for instance, someone was to launch a missile or something at this wall, catastrophic structural failure, and we'd have to evacuate. It's, it can't be used anymore. In a bacterium, it's similar. You destroy that wall, you punch a massive hole in it, like in a fuselage of an aircraft at 30,000 feet in the air, it's gone. That's crashing. And so that's the basis of the blue light. Blue light is almost like a hammer hitting a nail. It's a physical damage of, of the bacterium. The red and the near infrared, they're more like controlled biochemical um, encouragement, if you like. The blue is just, let's just destroy it by using this um, reactive oxygen species. So I hope that's been helpful. Remember, red, near infrared, blue, 633, 830, 415, roughly speaking. And if you are gonna look for a device with those wavelengths, look at something called the peak tolerance. Peak tolerance basically means if the intended wavelength is, I'll pick a round number, 100, doesn't mean all wavelengths produced are gonna be at 100 nanometers. It means mostly 100, some below, some above. But how far below and how far above, that's the peak tolerance. So if you ask for 100 nanometers, or say 415 for blue, you don't want the low end of that being something like 350 and the high end being 515, because you're paying for 415, but the majority is nowhere near that. So you want as tight a, a width of wavelengths produced as possible, that's the peak tolerance. So 415 is in the middle, a good peak tolerance would be something like two nanometers. So at worst you get 413 and 417. That's, for me, that's acceptable. That with the technology we have nowadays, anything worse than that, not good enough. I won't use it on myself. I certainly wouldn't recommend it for any patients either. But like I said, I hope that's been helpful. This video was actually inspired by my school group online where I teach stuff like this multiple times a week, live, so everyone can ask questions. And if you're interested in that, the link is in the description below. And thank you for watching.